Good morning, everyone. Um, hit my okays here on Zoom. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for um, joining us this morning. Um, just wanted to convene um, this meeting. Uh, uh, the August 26th Community Hospice Ombudsman Work Group um, at 10 o'clock. Um, and I just wanted to say one thank you for joining. This is something that's really important to me and really important to a constituent of mine. And your time and effort um, to make this uh, work group a success uh, is really appreciated. Um, so with that, I was thinking that we'd start the meeting. Hopefully everybody got a copy of the agenda that was sent out earlier this week. Um, with that, I was just going to go um, and I will call on you um, just to make it uh, easy and smooth, but I was hoping we could start with introductions. Um, my name is Lucy Dayton. Uh, I represent Norwalk and New Canaan in the 142nd district um, here in Connecticut. I am a member of the Human Services um, uh, Committee, and that's the, the hat I'm wearing today um, in, in working on this work group. Um, if everybody could just introduce themselves with a, just a minute of who they are um, and what they're um, looking forward to about bringing to this work group um, so that we can um, know who's involved. I'm gonna start with uh, Dorian Long. She's at the top of my list here. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, I uh, am the Director of Social Work Services at the Connecticut Department of Social Services. And um, it, within that realm, we administer a number of programs, but probably the most salient is the Protective Services for the Elderly Program that follows up on uh, maltreatment issues. Uh, I'm just gonna uh, let you know that unfortunately, I do need to leave at uh, 10.30 uh, this morning, but I am glad to offer whatever I can to support this effort. Uh, I have to take my mom to the doctor, so we all know how that all is. So, um, but uh, glad to be here today. Welcome, Dorian. Thank you for joining for a little bit. Um, Jennifer Calvera, and if I pronounced your name wrong, please correct me. Sure, good morning. I'm Jennifer Cavallero. I am the director for the Community Options Operations Team and uh, the Community Options um, unit is focused, of course, on the long-term support services for older adults and those with disabilities. And I'm responsible for managing the Medicaid waivers. So um, can I get home care program, personal care assistance, autism, the uh, acquired brain injury. Um, and really excited to have been asked to join the work group. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, Charles Du. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Charles Dew. I'm the policy director for 1199. Uh, we're the union that represents long-term care workers uh, in nursing homes and group homes and home care. Um, and I'm really excited to be a part of this group. Um, you know, uh, you know, we, our, our union believes in advancing resident well-being, and that's ultimately what our members why they do their work. Um, so excited to be here. Thanks, everyone. Wonderful, thank you, Charles. Um, Tracy Wodach. Good morning, everyone. Tracy Wodach, I'm the president and CEO of the Connecticut Association for Healthcare at Home, supporting uh, the licensed home health, licensed hospice, and non-medical home care uh, homemaker companion agencies. Great, I think many are familiar with you. Thank you, Tracy. I'm glad you're here. Uh, Diane Lorisella. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Diane Lorisella, and I am uh, one of those constituents that uh, approached Representative Dathan. So I'm very pleased and happy that um, she recognized, as many of you do, that there's uh, some things that uh, might need additional support. And I am a, a former regulator with DEEP, but right now I'm an environmental um, consultant. And I especially, I really am interested in processes and um, tweaking processes if necessary to make them work better or realize their goal. And um, I think it's really important for us to, uh, as this particular need is uh, being realized more and more in our modern day 
healthcare system, uh, there um, appears to be some needs for some uh, potential oversight, but also to understand from the um, service side, what are the what are the challenges and what kind of support the service side of this equation needs in addition to, of course, the uh, person in need of the service. So I thank you so much, uh, Representative Dathan and others for putting this together. Great, thank you, Diane, for joining. Uh, Melissa Morton. Hi, my name is Melissa Morton. I am with the Office of Policy and Management, and I administered the uh, labor contract for home care workers for the 11, District 1199 and also work on the state's long-term services and supports rebalancing data. And I'm very pleased to be uh, joining everyone today. Thank you so much, Melissa. Chris Santacero. Hi, good morning, everybody, and thank you for uh, including me in this very expansive group. Uh, I'm Chris Antisera, like you said, Director of Public Affairs with VITAS Hospice Care. I've been providing services in the state to terminally ill patients since 2004. Uh, and the minute we entered the state, um, we've recognized that there's a big need for modernization of the hospice care benefit in terms of regulation. Um, this session, fortunately, um, the legislature adopted a uh, regulatory category that we're hoped soon to get started on to finally license hospice care providers as hospices in Connecticut. Um, we're the only state in the country uh, that still does not do that. Uh, and I think there's going to be um, a lot of benefit to patients and families once this category is recognized because Hospice care is very unique. It's an interdisciplinary, integrated model of care, holistic model of care for the term ill. And um, I hope that all of the folks on this work group will participate in that process with the Department of Health when it starts. Uh, there'll be a form of regulatory process, hopefully within the next six months to a year. Um, and it's long overdue and look forward to contributing to this group as well, because Quite frankly, um, you don't get a second chance to do the best you can for a hospice patient and their family. Um, and uh, just looking forward to contributing, working with everyone to make our, our care for the terminally ill uh, as best as it can be. So thank you. Sorry, I'm having some issues here. Um, Dawn Lambert, thank you, Chris. Good morning, Representative Dathans. Dawn Lambert, Department of Social Services, Division of Health Services. I co-lead the Community Options Unit along with Jennifer Cavallaro. My responsibilities are um, strategy, design of new initiatives, rolling out and building new initiatives. I also, relevant to this work group, am a member of the National Academy of State Health Policy, specifically the Palliative and Hospice Work Group. Um, and so hopefully I can bring some of the best practices from that particular work group forward. Um, lastly, we are working on a redesign of palliative and hospice care within the Medicaid benefit. So we have some ongoing work related to that. So hopefully there are some connections with the things that you all be working on. It's nice to be here. Nice to have you, Don. Thank you so much. Representative Comey. Hi, everybody. Good to be a part of this committee. I'm Representative Comey. I represent uh, Brantford, uh, most of Brantford, the 102nd district. Um, we have uh, lots of lots of seniors and healthcare, uh, home health care uh, agencies, as well as the first hospice. Um, um, in the country here is the home uh, just down the street from me. So um, personally, I've um, experienced some of uh, the care issues with family members, uh, home care issues, and it's always been very um, meaningful and important to the family. And we've experienced it in a variety of states. So um, I'm just um, um, anxious to learn more about uh, sort of the role. I've not, I've sit on insurance, and I sit on um, um, education and the Children's Committee, but um, I'm interested to hear more about, you know, Medicare, Medicaid issues, human services um, um, angle of all of this. So I'll be doing a lot of listening. Thank you. 
Thank you, Representative. Um, Mered um, Painter, and I'm, I'm, I know it rhymes with parade, but sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, it happens all the time. One sorry. more time for us. Maraid. Like Maraid, okay, Maraid. Yep, thank yep. you. So I'm Maraid Painter, I'm the state long-term care ombudsman. And again, a lot of people don't know what that is. Um, we've had, we've learned since the pandemic um, and actually from this group and bills that have been raised that there's still a lot of questions about what we do, who we represent and where we actually work. I've heard that I work at a lot of different agencies. I have historically, but I don't currently. So we are administratively housed at the Department of Aging and Disability Services. And the reason for that is that um, my role has to have a level of autonomy because we're kind of what you would consider a watchdog agency. You make sure that individuals are getting the care and services that they want and that at the state level, they're providing and giving access to within long-term care settings, that they're giving high quality care and that the person gets to determine um, the care that they want and has a say in a person-centered way. So we do a lot of that work. We are seeing that, um, as Dawn was saying, there's a lot changing, right? So the industry is changing um, and so are the settings that we cover. We currently go into nursing homes, MRCs, managed residential communities or assisted living and um, residential care homes. And so those services are being offered more at lower levels of care. Um, and so the services that we provide are going in that direction as well. We're in, across the country, we're seeing more questions and community ombudsman um, programs open up. This is specific to hospice, but interested in having that conversation. So thank you for having me here today. It's wonderful having you. Thank you for your time. Um, Mary Feely. Good morning. Um, I am a hospice clinical social worker with over 15 years experience direct with patients and families in the home setting. I have also worked inpatient as well, but my first love and what I have done mostly is working with patients and families, both in their own homes, as well as in uh, skilled nursing facilities and assisted living facilities for the bulk of my, my time doing hospice. And I'm happy to be here and part of the, the work group and hope to bring my experience and insights to the to the group. Thank you, Mary. Um, nice to have you here. Uh, Teresa Bachhuber. Bachhuber. You say that like a family member. Um, <laughs> very nice. It's the uh, German ancestry, I think. <laughs> there you go. Thank you so much. Um, um, it's great to be here and, and thank you for assembling this great group. Um, I come representing Seasons Hospice and Palliative Care um, and have been the executive director for Seasons Connecticut for about seven years. I shifted gears earlier in the year and decided to step back and I'm now working in a capacity of national director of executive operations um, on more of a part-time basis. Um, but I come to all of you or come to this committee with this work group with over 30 years of home care and hospice experience and um, looking forward to, you know, lending any expertise that I might um, to, to further this endeavor. So thank you. Thank you, Teresa. It's nice to have you here. Um, Anna Doragazi. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Anna Doragazi. I'm one of the policy directors at AARP Connecticut, um, and I focus mostly on our health and family portfolio and livable communities. Um, one of AARP's goals as an organization is to help people choose how they live as they age. Um, and we have a lot of research that backs up the fact that most people want to stay in their homes and communities as they age. So, um, you know, we're thrilled to be part of this conversation and, you know, really any policy conversation that's looking at um, how to help people make that choice to stay at home and to do so safely, um, make sure they have the services they need. So thank you so much for including us. Wonderful, Anna. Thank you for being here. Um, Joshua Beckett, Flores. Sorry. Joshua? 
Right. Is there anybody that I missed? I see we, we do have some people from, um, we have Adam J. And then we have some, yes, hot, hello, Adam. Hi, I'm just one of the staff members. How are we doing? Right. Okay. And then uh, thank you for, for joining. And Joshua Beckett, and you're from the House, House Dems. Joshua? Good morning. I'm a policy analyst for Human Services from the Speaker's Office. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Hernandez? Hi, Representative Dathan. Thank you so much for bringing us together, first and foremostly. And it's just a real honor to be here among just a really thoughtful group around these issues. You know, hospice can be um, if done right, if done well, with human dignity at the core, uh, can really be one of the most important parts of transition for a family uh, and for an individual. So I'm so glad that you're convening this conversation. We're ready to help you as your staff in any way that we can. Great, thank you, Stephen, and we're glad you're here. Um, uh, Sean Cleary. He might be part of the uh, policy team as well. I'm not familiar with Sean. Uh, Sean, can you hear me? A Republican policy analyst. Oh, okay. Well, I'm glad he's here. Um, and then, in terms, uh, and then we have from uh, Representative uh, uh, from LCO Murray Brady. Um, so, uh, anyway. Um, I am, I think I got everybody. Let me know if I forgot somebody. Um, great, well, again, thank you everyone for being here. We're just gonna kind of dive um, into the, the sort of key topics um, of this work group and what we're looking to achieve out of it. Um, you know, it's my, my thoughts, the, the kind of background really was, um, I had my constituent uh, Diane Lorisella approached me, um, and I'm going to let her have a minute to speak about some of her her, her experience and, and and what caused us to get here. But really, we wanted to try to figure out if this is something that we need for our state um, and something that is going to benefit um, the uh, residents who are in a hospice situation, um, so that they we can uh, support them. Um, and we, you know, there's a lot of things that we need to consider um, in adopting this. Do we have, um, where would this sit, for example, if this is something we decide to go through? Um, what sort of other sort of concerns that maybe um, the workers in this um, space have to, to think about? What are the things that we can do to support this community? Um, and uh, ensuring, you know, and I think importantly, how are we going to pay for it if we if we do have it? So there's a lot of things um, that we need to consider. But um, I'm going to call on uh, Diane Lorisella uh, quickly, um, and if you can just spend maybe two minutes on um, your background, uh, why this is important to you. Thank you, Representative Dathan. Um, yes. Uh, um, my sisters and I had a situation that many of us have had and many of my friends have had where it comes to a point where um, doing family home, home care or caretaking becomes too much due to either lack of time with jobs uh, or um, lack of skill set. And so we came to a time when we were uh, researching what uh, services were available for my mother who was at the time 92. And um, uh, not only was it sometimes difficult to, to navigate what kind of services, but when we did decide on um, the, uh, the need for uh, hospice care due to some medical issues, uh, cumulative medical issues, um, we uh, ran into some difficulty in the, the level of care but also we were assured by the uh, eventual vendor that we used that the patient could opt out if they changed their mind. Um, what resulted is that there was, a, of course, which happens, some disagreements amongst the daughters. Um, I was not the first, I, I forget what it's called, power of medical attorney or 
I forget there's a new term for that. I had, I was second, my older sister was in charge and there was a point where there was a disagreement um, where my mother would tell me one thing and my sister another. And uh, it got to be uh, quite uh, difficult because of the, the issues relating to hospice care and the role of towards the end care of using morphine, uh, not allowing for uh, vitamins and food. It was, it was just, it was a lot. It wasn't the, um, the, the, the happy or peaceful death that my mother and all of us had intended. And I, at that point, noted that there was very, it was confusing as to who I could reach out to because I could not afford an attorney to intervene. Um, so I looked at the state services, got to the point where I did, uh, I felt my mother's uh, was in danger because of some decisions that she didn't want, but others did. And um, I did uh, file a complaint for protective services with DSS. Unfortunately, she passed away before they could complete their evaluation. But long story short is that um, I know that um, hospice services are very well needed in our society. Um, something went wrong with maybe oversight or certification. And from that, I learned that um, the quality of care is, um, uh, there's oversight in the licensing, but at times uh, there is not always a consistency in services. So I think um, this, this will be helpful to see if there's a need for additional ombudsman watchdog, and it would be used infrequently because I do believe that the training and the services promised that normally there are social workers in the hospice care industry that are supposed to sit down with the family and try to sort it out. But if that's not, can't happen, then I believe there is a need for someone just to say, let's press the pause button and sort out these issues. I mean, again, I think it was a unique circumstance. I'd like to think that because I do feel I'm not against hospice care. It, I think it's needed in many circumstances, but something happened here. And then I started talking to my friends who had similar circumstances and it was numerous people. So I think possibly there's a need just for us to examine the definitions of, of, of what the roles will be, the oversight currently in place. Is there any enforcement to make sure that those roles are being handled properly? And then the issue, I think, uh, including in what happens when the person who has the power of medical attorney doesn't agree with the patient? What do you do then? Um, that may or may not be inclusive here, but it is, it, it is an issue at times. So I, thanks, I thank you again. I don't know if that was enough, uh, Representative Dathan. It ended up that uh, my family was bad. I mean, we are broken up because of the experiences we had and I'd much rather be a shining uh, marketing um, person that says hospice in America works, it's important. And I, I think, um, Right now, I can't. I cannot say that. However, I I feel that with just some tweaking uh, and some looking at systems, making sure they're operating smoothly, I think we can get there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Diane. Um, I really wanted to focus today's meeting on um, you know kind of more of a, an organizational meeting, if you will. And um, what I was hoping that we could do is. Um, open up for a discussion on some of the sort of key um, areas that we need to be addressing to determine if um, we will be um, going forward with such legislation. And the, the sort of the key things that I've been focused in on is really, um, you know, um, some of the, the, the sort of background and what I was hoping is that um, I could call on um, Maraid and have her to give some of the background. I think, oh, there she is. Um, and just kind of the, some of the background and what's happening within um, your uh, organization and, and your responsibility and why this might be a separate um, sort of role so that this group kind of has an understanding of um, you know, how this might be different than we already see in the long-term care ombudsman's office. Sure. So to give you some people may be familiar with our office, some may not, 
my office consists of myself. Um, and then I have eight regional ombudsmen and two administrative um, intake coordinators and an administrative assistant. And so for the regional ombudsman, we are required federally anytime we receive a complaint to go out and talk to the person in person. So when we receive a complaint from a family member, a friend, conservator, power of attorney, we go and directly speak to the resident or the individual about what they want us to do. We, our role is different than, um, and did Dorian pop off, um, then protective services, then the Department of Public Health, because we are not mandated reporters. We are carved out differently because we want the person to be able to talk with us, for us to be able to inform them of their rights and help them negotiate what they would like to see as far as their care and services. That's also why we cannot sit within the Department of Public Health or the Department of social services because it's seen as a conflict of interest. Any agency that pays for has oversight or licensure. So as we're seeing sort of the continuum change and shift, we see more individuals choosing um, the least restrictive environment. One of the things we're seeing is other types of housing pop up. We see a lot of um, apartment structures that have assisted living in them. And we've actually been talking about, you know, do we cover them because we cover assisted living? Um, only having eight team members, that would really thin us out. We had, it was an unfunded mandate when we started in the assisted living arena and looking at the care and services through home care provided there. It's usually a, um, an ALSA agency, assisted living agency that's in place that provides some of the services. But again, with eight people, our, we have a lot of focus on the nursing homes and then we do the residential care homes as well where they receive assisted living. And in all of these settings, there is a hospice component. So we do um, represent individuals who are on hospice currently, just not in their own homes. Now, nationally, there's been a real focus on this. Some states already have community ombudsmen. I don't know if states that have specific hospice ombudsmen, but community ombudsmen that, because individuals now have the right to receive their long-term services and supports in the setting of their choosing, where they can choose to have um, services at home under a waiver. There are programs that receive them, receive our services in their home. And so they have sort of under the state unit, they have two units. They have the unit that works in long-term care sort of in the facilities. And then they have a unit that focuses on um, being on, on the community side. There's different funding patterns for that. Every state does that a little bit differently, but we have seen um, most recently under the infrastructure bill, different ideas popping up about how funding would be done in order to support that um, as they want jobs to grow and move in that direction. I'm not sure if you have other questions around that representative that I can answer for you or other people. I think that that's great. I would like open it up to questions um, specifically for her before we kind of um, kind of delve into the, the sort of pros and cons um, about um, such a such a, um, a position. I'm going to call in uh, Tracy Bodach first. Thank you, Representative Dathan. And I apologize, I forgot at the beginning to say that I do need to bow out about 5 of 11 because we have our uh, monthly DPH call. Um, but Murray, can you um, share it all on data as far as between you and the eight regional ombudsmen, how many complaints you get? Uh, I don't know if you measure it by month or whatever the data is, and, and then um, how you're able to manage the workload, I suppose. So I, uh, productivity, I guess, is what I'm looking at. Sure. Well, and the other thing is, of course, because it was 2020, they changed our federal reporting requirements and our data collection in 20. Um, and so it looks a little bit different, but we, ha and we have what's considered a complaint and then what's considered a case. Or, and um, sometimes we just do consultation. People just want to know information. So as far as complaints in 2020, um, we had almost 4,000 complaints. That doesn't count um, like that, the consultations and activities that we do or training in 
different settings and communities. But it really breaks down by um, region and the regional ombudsman is responsible for the homes that they're assigned to and the towns that they're assigned to. Um, I have had to look at as, you know, if there's a, a closure, um, some areas have more nursing homes than others. So you may see at times that your regional ombudsman who's assigned changes, and that's due to influx in cases. Right now we have a, a really large caseload in the greater Hartford and greater New Haven areas. And so those ombudsmen have many fewer towns, but a lot of homes and provide a lot of services in those towns. How does that compare that 4,000 to uh, prior years pre-COVID? And again, it's hard to do the comparison because they changed the definition of a case center. Yeah. Um, but I would say we, we were up about a, a quarter in calls that we were getting and, and the cases um, and trying to manage that. We also can't count it as, a, as an open case unless we meet with the person in person. That's a federal guidance. And during COVID, we weren't allowed to meet with them in person. So yeah. many it's really going to skew our numbers and what that looks like. Um, so we have talked with our federal partners about that. Um, a window, you know, there's just different things that don't count and we need to have that recategorized. But we were up about a quarter and working seven days a week versus five. So I think this year is a hard one to reflect on. Historically, we've gone up about, I would say about two to 300 cases a year prior to 2020. Thank you. Yep. And since you don't really deal with a lot of people who are, you know, in the home setting rather than, you know, you're looking at more facilities, um, I think, you know, where this specific, specific role would be a lot more focused in on the individual home care settings rather than necessarily um, a facility is my understanding. And um, I can imagine that that's one reason why, um, because there's been so many issues with, you know, uh, COVID and how it's affected the older generation. Um, yes, the one thing I didn't say that I think is important that there's different levels. So Department of Public Health investigates complaints to licensure code, right? So um, home care is licensed. And so when DPH gets those complaints, they have a certain structure in which they must investigate them too. Mm -hmm. Accountability if they hold them to. And the same thing goes for protective services. So protective services has certain um, responsibilities and inf investigation um, requirements that they must do to meet their um, statutory and regulatory language. As well for us, we do it to the satisfaction of the person. So it's a little bit different. So even though we may all get the same case and we may all be investigating the same case, it is not totally uncommon for us to have different um, findings, different that we do communicate um, when confidentiality um, permissions are given, uh, but we'd have, the roles are very separate in how things are investigated and why and what the outcome is of those investigations. Then the question is, you know, how much would a um, Department of Consumer Protection um, be acting in the um, in the interest of, you know, a, a, a community uh, ombudsman? And I would love to get your sort of insight on that. Um, we work with them and make referrals as necessary. We currently work with them more on the assisted living and residential care home side because we're working with home care agencies or also in those settings. And if an individual has a question, concern, complaint, whether it be a, a licensed home care or maybe it's a um, homemaker companion type of service that someone is paying to have come in or an unlicensed to self-hired and maybe an assisted living, they hire someone independently to come in. We still work with those individuals. And those are cases when it's um, unlicensed or it's an agency that it goes to the Department of Consumer Protection. And we currently work with them. Um, we make referrals to them and help individuals understand 
the role of that state agency um, and their investigations. Got it. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I've got a question here from Teresa. Teresa, I'll give you the floor. Thank you so much. Um, and I too, like Tracy, forgot to share that I have to get off at about five minutes to the hour due to a DPH meeting. Um, so my question is for Maraid. Um, so you, since you, since you um, not investigate, but since you see so many cases in long-term care facilities and MRCs, um, do you have a sense of the number that are related to hospice? because there's more and more hospices do providing care in long-term care facilities and assisted living communities, or MRCs. Mm -hmm. I would say we probably had more cases related to hospice this year than historically. And it's probably opposite of what you would think. It was about individuals getting access to their hospice. So residents or family members may have been calling us and saying, I, we want this service and I think there was an incredible need and us advocating with the buildings, helping them understand and the residents right to those services, even during this period of time, the hospice, the role that they were playing and advocating to have hospice involved. So although a case may say, that's why it would be hard for me to give Tracy asked for the numbers, how many cases involved hospice, the number might be very high because we also try to do a lot of education and, um, dispelling of myths when we talk to a resident, when as soon as we, if the nursing home is talking hospice, sometimes the individual or their family might react and think, oh, they just, they don't wanna care. You know, there's all kinds of reasons that people react, right? Because it's hard to hear. The RO might go in and talk with them as the independent person about what that looks like, why they're offering it, what hospice might be able to offer them and really encourage them to at least do the consult, at least get all the information so that they can make it. We are really big on people making informed decisions and that be the person's choice and not necessarily um, uh, just a family member if the individual can speak for themselves and providing that um, information and maybe some access, who is the provider in the building? Well, maybe, maybe they didn't have a great experience, but there's lots of other providers that may be the preferred provider there, but what else can we do to support them? Because I think that hospice for not only the individual, the family, I know in some, in some situations, you know, there's lots of situations where everything doesn't go great in all kinds of um, arenas, but I don't think it's utilized enough in the support. So we're trying to do a lot of education around that. And that's something that the regional ombudsman often talk to people about. Thank you for thank you for that education and thank you for the work that you do. Really appreciate it. And good luck in this next round. I'm sure you're getting the same onslaught with Delta out there. So uh, lots of facilities are closing up again. So thank, thank you. you. Um, thank you for that question. I'm conscious of people's time, and it sounds like a lot of people have a hard stop. And so um, what I was hoping that maybe. Um, what we can do with some of the, the remaining time here is, oh, I'm going to actually let um, Mary ask the question. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the avenues that families have for complaints, and they're informed of this at the time of signing on to the benefit, is to reach out to Department of Public Health. And I'm wondering if it's possible to look at the data from them as far as the complaints that have been made, because I'm wondering if this is something that's wide scale. Um, I know that we do have individual complaints, but yeah, I'm thinking, you know, over the course of the past year or even five years, because I think we can agree 2020 was really uh, difficult for a lot of people on so many levels. And just in my own practice, seeing a lot of people that have come onto hospice rather than placing people back in the hospitals and looking at that sometimes as their one of their uh, lesser of two evils. Um, but can we get data from the Depart Department of Public Health to see over the course of a couple of years, has there been an increase in complaints. There's a difference between people having difficulty and issues with how 
the family dealt and how their family member died or was treated or disagreements in the family to then making complaints at the state level. Um, and I think it just warrants looking at, does the data support this to have a whole committee and then a bill? And certainly if it, if it does, then that's fine. We go, you know, go forward with that. But I'm just wondering, you know, are the numbers there? I, I think that is a great and, point. And what's the, um, yeah, I also think just another point that time, that time is of the essence. You know, we often take people on and we have days with them. And what's the response time going to be for an ombudsman to get out or make contact with that family? Um, it, it happens regularly. People are staying in treatment longer, um, getting referred to hospice right at the end. And so then it leaves families with the feeling that it was hospice that killed their family member and hospice did something wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and it leaves a very bad taste in their mouths. And so, you know, it, it really affects their grieving and, um, you know, it opens the door to a whole host of issues. So the response time is really critical. And when someone has an ombudsman has a big region and a call comes in and someone comes on to hospice and they're actively dying and the family is struggling with it, an ombudsman needs to be able to go out there and respond, COVID or no COVID. That family is reaching for that added layer of support. And that person needs to be out there. And I can speak to our timelines if you'd like. Our timelines are, they get a call back. Someone goes to see them within two days. And we, I'm actually really proud of the timelines that we meet. Um, we triage cases and hospice cases in particular. Um, someone is there within two days to meet with them, to open the case and to talk with the individual. Before then, family members, whoever's calling the complaint in, speaks to the intake coordinator um, and the RO. That's an impressive turnaround time. But you raise a good point. I mean, I, I know with some individuals, they might be referred to hospice and then die later that day. Um, and that happens because people are staying in treatment longer. Um, and I, I do think that that's an issue, whether it's, you know, COVID related or in most cases not. Um, but I, I would like to explore how we can get some more data on this. And um, I don't know what's the best um, route for getting such data, um, like maybe an analysis of um, how, uh, do you have any um, ideas, favorite? I think, so always, I think I would ask the Department of Public Health. I don't know how they it would it'd be an ask. I really have no idea, but to look at um, the coding of that. I think also from the hospice themselves, um, I don't know if through the benefit you can see either from DSS or on the Medicare side, if there was a way to see the utilization. I'm hoping that the utilization is going up. I know that we're really trying to educate people around that and to get on sooner rather than later and the benefits of it. So I don't know if there's a way to see what is the utilization, because certainly if the utilization is higher, you might expect that people's you know, concerns are higher. And again, for us, just because someone calls us about hospice doesn't mean it's a complaint. In okay. a what you would consider a tradition, that's why I, I, if you look at our hospice numbers, it may be about accessing hospice, the nursing home, not having access. You know, it may not, the complaint may not exactly be related to a, a hospice service, it might be related that the overall topic is about hospice, um, but not about bad service from the hospice. So I wouldn't want people to look at my numbers in a raw way and make assumptions about them. Um, but DPH might be able to give you if there were specific hospice related um, investigations on their side, but they would have to speak to how they categorize that. Okay, I'm going to add that to uh, our, our action items, um, and hopefully we, we have some um, data for the, the next meeting. Um, Mary, I appreciate it. Maybe um, if you have any other um, sort of ideas around that, if, if you could um, uh, 
think about that so that we can come to the, the next meeting um, with a little bit more background. Um, awesome. Thank you. Uh, Tracy, I'm going to, I think you're, you're next on the list of uh, speakers. Yeah, thank you, Representative Dathan. Um, and Mairead and I can take that uh, issue offline and, and work on it between now and the next meeting. Um, but I wanted to let the group know that I did uh, speak to Barbara Cass, who is the branch chief for facility and licensing at the Department of Public Health, and um, told her that this work group was assembling and what the goal of it was, um, and asked if there could be representation from DPH on the work group. Um, she didn't know about someone specific that she would assign, but she certainly said if there are questions coming forward um, or a time when you may want a DPH to do any type of a, um, maybe a presentation, an education presentation to the group to answer questions, that they'd certainly be happy to do that. Um, I can get the information from um, DPH regarding the complaints that have come in. And I know we're focused a lot on hospice today in our discussion, but I know in our pre-meeting, we did talk a little bit more about a community program versus just hospice focused. Um, so any, um, any regulatory oversight of licensure, which would be for us home health or hospice, um, DPH could help with that uh, data. And then as Mairead pointed out, the um, homemaker companion agencies are registered with the Department of Consumer Protection. So uh, DCP would be able to get us the um, data on, I would think, on any complaints that have come in through there. You know, it's, it's unfortunate because the um, issue that um, uh, Diane brought forward, you know, a family dynamic uh, issue um, is something that may not rise to the occasion of going to DPH. Um, that's something that truly I, you know, the, the social worker within the hospice agency would, should um, become aware of that, uh, you know, whether the family's willing to bring it forward or not um, is another, you know, another question, but that is an avenue that's available and that doesn't always rise to a, to a formal complaint to DPH. Um, and, and those are the situations I think that you're, you're, looking for some support on, and, and Mairead gave some really good examples, and I'm really happy to hear how much education her regional ombudsmen are doing um, regarding hospice, because we certainly are suffering um, in, uh, in the United States in general regarding late hospice referrals, but Connecticut has historically been um, the bottom of the line really last in the state for, for many years on last minute hospice referrals. And to answer Mairead's question in her hopes that uh, hospice data is now showing an improvement in um, you know, more long, uh, long stays and later our earlier referrals, we are seeing a little bit of an uptick now. The last couple of years we've seen an uptick and certainly utilization of um, hospice, the referrals to hospice is, um, is more in line with national uh, benchmarks right now than it ever used to be. So we are certainly seeing some, some positive trends that way, but um, not where we'd like to be, but we're, we're seeing improvements. So I can get data and I'll work with Mairead on uh, offline and try to get through uh, some data for the next meeting. Right, I'm gonna take you up on that, Tracy. I really appreciate it. I think also um, uh, we can uh, hopefully find a, a good contact within DCP to figure out the, the complaint um, and make sure that we um, have that for the next meeting as well. Um, Don, I'm gonna call on you, you have your hand up. Um. Just with respect to data, I think, uh, as I mentioned um, in the beginning, DHS, we are doing some research on this, University of Connecticut Center on Aging. They do have all the Medicare and Medicaid data. They are looking at the hospice uh, data. They're looking at length of time in hospice. So there isn't another data source where there's been quite a bit of work that's been done and some ongoing research that's already being funded by the state. Um, that we might want to pull in. So just as a suggestion, I would I would definitely incorporate, they've spent a lot of time looking at the data and this is definitely a focus area right now for our division. So I just suggest perhaps pulling in uh, University of Connecticut Center on Aging to this group so that they can share and we don't reinvent the wheel with looking at what the various, they do have the primary source, Medicare, Medicaid data, 
they have the claims and they're analyzing them. So that's just one other piece. I, I hear in terms of design, and I think Representative Dathan, you were saying like data is very important. I would actually be most interested in um, trying to conduct some sort of survey. Um, I wouldn't necessarily point to our existing system of complaints to be an indication necessarily of what would happen with what's something very, very different in the ombudsman model than what we have right now um, as a complaint system, very valuable complaint system, but it really is not the model of pulling in an ombudsman for the people that we serve to give them a voice in the home that they currently don't have. Frankly, it doesn't exist in our state. So getting an estimate of demand through a survey, which we might be able to help with, with you know, in some way, I'd be interested in, in helping with that just to get that data and say to the people, is this something you think would be of value? And we all know in that moment that could all change. Right. I mean, there's one thing to think about that moment. And there's another thing to be in that moment. I understand that, but I think it'd be helpful. And then from there, speaking to the budget and the design, if we move forward, do we think it's possible to fund something? And this went back to, uh, I think it was Diane's concern about length of time from point of contact. If this is stood up, we have to be able to deliver. And it can't be a what if, it can't be a what if scenario. And, and I would just hope, and I, Maraid may or may not agree, I wouldn't want it to take away from our existing response rate with people in the nursing homes in the way that that is. We would have to be an add-on, and I think we'd have to have capacity to know how quickly we can turn it around based on our estimates of demand. So we set it up for success, and then get the outreach out there, do the marketing so that people, and that's the last thing I want to offer, is very often people don't ask for something because they don't know. This could be, however, incorporated with the ARPA initiative that's moving forward, that's going right into the homes to say, here's what you should expect. Here is what you, here's where you can reach out. So there's an intersect that we could make for the outreach if, if this is coordinated, if there's additional funding we find somewhere to fund this either on a small local level or uh, on a broader level, so. Yeah, I think excellent point um, that I think, you know, the one, Thing that we also have to consider with the, the, the data from um, the University of Connecticut in the Center of Aging is we wouldn't be dealing, you know, that's probably less um, for, for, it's more relevant for kind of older populations that are going through hospice. You know, we do need to think about the um, younger generations who are having to go through um, this and we want to make sure we're um, getting all of that data as well. Um, it's, but, it's just um, they're brought, they're from zero, they, they now, are, their research is all ages right now. Oh, okay. And I was, when you said aging, I got a little. Yeah, concerned. yeah just to clarify, sorry. Okay. Thank you for that. I'm glad you did. Um, and Don, to your, like sorry. To Go ahead, Mary. Sorry. Don's point to funding, just that it wouldn't impact the long-term care side because those dollars are specific. And I, that's one of my jobs is to oversee that. And that um, you know some of the new funding coming out through the Elder Justice Act, we do see it also as a justice issue um, federally. That we'll be looking towards ACL, which is our so CMS and ACL are both under HHS, and they will give us directions as to how that can be used. But the funds right now are specific to individuals in the settings that we cover, and so we wouldn't be able to supplant them or use them in a different way it would have to be the additional funds coming in um, for staff and teaming. Thank you for, for clarifying that because uh, I do want to have, you know, I'm, I'm looking that we, we would have, um, you know, almost a, a whole time discussing uh, funding and how that might work as well as um, where it might be placed kind of um, within that discussion. And, um, but it, it, is, it is very important. Um, Diane, I'm going to call on you next. You have your, your hand raised. Yes, I'll be very brief. Uh, just for reference, uh, my mother's case was not uh, last minute, um, so uh, I won't go into it. But um, I'm very happy with what uh, Ms. Lampert, Dawn Lampert, and others have said, very thoughtful comments about making sure this doesn't take away from other systems. But I just wanted to say, if we're looking at data, uh, staff are, make sure we include DSS's protective services um, for the elderly, 
uh, I will say I had to really dig and use all my background as an investigator to find out that this service was available. So in a not a perfect world, but a better world, one of the outcomes I'd love to see with this work is that there's more education up front with patients and their families about all of the services. Of course, we don't hope it comes to an ombudsman, but it may. And uh, I think, and, or protective service investigation. Apparently um, there are at times as Ms., as Mayra uh, said, P M Mairead said um, that at times all th there are three or four different agencies working on the same patient. And that is kind of interesting. I think maybe um, we should look at that too so that we could maybe um, be more efficient. Uh, I know everyone operates under different rules and regulations. So that's probably why there's three different investigators looking at the same patient, but there must be a way maybe to um, integrate that. Agree. Thank you, uh, Diane. Uh, Jennifer, um, I'm going to explain you next. You have your hand raised. Thank you. Um, my first point was just that I could help with a contact at um, Department of Consumer Protection to get their data. Um, we, um, in community options, work hand in hand with them because we're working with the non-medical um, providers and um, we have um, improved, you know, I think our communication in making sure that, you know, just as Diane is talking about that multiple entities are investigating similar issues, um, we have, you know, regular communication with them so I can get some data uh, on that. And I think also speaking to Diane's point that, you know, it is an initiative um, across multiple departments to have ongoing communication so that, you know, resources are um, coordinated and that you don't have, um, again, multiple um, departments investigating sort of the same issue and how can we, you know, partner better. That would be great, Jennifer. If you could pass that uh, along to our administrator and uh, I copy myself and um, figure out how we get that important data. Um, great. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Stephen Hernandez, you have your, your hand up. Representative Dathan, thank you. So uh, we'd like to offer, and I see that my colleague, Michael Werner, who's focusing on these issues for us and with us at the commission is here. Uh, we'd love to work with Mairead to bring national data if we can find it on this issue, because my sense is that Connecticut, you know, Connecticut is a microcosm of the rest of the country and that there will be examples that we can draw from in other states. I always worry about Connecticut's data, and this is no criticism of anyone on the phone, but sometimes we just don't have enough of it and we don't collect it robustly enough or cross-examine it in ways that uh, other uh, jurisdictions may. So I, I think that could really come to bear in this conversation. We'd be happy to do that. Great, thank you so much, Stephen. That's a, it's a, it's a good point. Um, I don't know, um, we've lost some people, but um, Marie, do you have any comments on how we could get some um, more data from other states? Sure, I mean, we, I can always reach out through our, we have a, um, an education center and put out a question to other states, we can ask ACL Administration for Community Living collects the data annually, um, the state's annual reports, especially if it's federal dollar driven. Um, so we can ask for that. It would just be helpful to have what people wanted to see. I think it's important when you're talking about having multiple agencies investigate, I think there's a, a misunderstanding about an ombudsman role. Ombudsmen do not investigate to a licensure standard. So it's really important for people to remember they're directed by the resident, by the person, whether DPH investigates, whether PSE investigates. The role of the ombudsman is to support the individual and their what they see as the quality of their care and their person-centered choices, and that it's not always a complaint. Sometimes it's just information. Sometimes it's reassurance about their plan. Sometimes it's about them working with their family members and getting their family on board with the decisions that they're making. So it's a, although we call it a complaint when it comes in, it doesn't mean it's a complaint regarding a system, a service, a provider. They're, it's a different skill than doing an investigation. It's about really focusing on um, person-centered choices and supporting the person. And 
our information is confidential even at um, to the state. So even if we get audited, at a federal level, we're confidential and carved out. So we can't just give over our information to DPH um, or DSS, even if we have a shared case, um, even to a family member if they're requesting and they might be the responsible party. If a resident tells us it's a private case and they don't want their family to know, we do not turn it over. We sometimes have to get information from other agencies at the request of a resident, but it's a different level of protection. Just to clarify, if there are licensure issues, that wouldn't be coming through your office. Is that what I'm understanding? Or is that would be slowly through um, if, if nope. there was they come through us. So if it's a, um, let's say it's a concern related to abuse, neglect, or a medication error or things like that. Sometimes it comes to our attention. Our role wouldn't be to just report that to DPH. Our role would be to work with the individual and see what they wanted to have. What is the outcome they're looking for? And are they, do they not want it to go to DPH? Do they prefer that we facilitate a conversation with the provider and work out a way to have it not happen again or issues like that? So we we drive by their um, direction. If they wanted it to go to DPH and to facilitate an outcome, we would do both. Um, so we do deal with medical concerns, licensure, the gamut to home yeah. care, somebody getting access to discharge planning, all of those things. Um, but we don't have a standard cadence or rhythm that we follow the way that DPH or PSE does. Got it. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, Chris, um, I'm going to call on you next. I just had a quick question for Marade. Um, are the eight regional ombudsmen's licensed or certified in any way? They're certified as regional ombudsmen. There's a national training platform that they have to do. Then there's annual um, recertification as well as for our volunteers. They're considered representatives of the program and they have to be recertified every annually. Are any of them LCSWs or social work? So social workers? Yep. We have oh, they are. people of all different backgrounds and degrees. Yes. Okay. Just curious. Thank you. Marie, I think you brought up something important. You know, there was um, what you and I spoke about back in April or March, it's kind of a, a blur. Um, but we talked about the volunteer network and you said one of the um, challenges your office is facing is because the number of volunteers um, that you would have um, has significantly gone down, which, you know, probably would um, be, be the same in the space. Could, do you mind just spending a minute um, bringing the, the group into that discussion? and how that might impact this? Sure, so the ombudsman program, some states like uh, New York, for example, has a small te state team, Massachusetts as well, and then they have two or 300 volunteers, but they also have state workers who are volunteer coordinators. So they have two, Massachusetts has two state employees who all they do is coordinate um, volunteer services. The goal really is to have a resident advocate in every setting, nursing home, residential care home, and assisted living. Um, at one point, Connecticut had, I think, about 170. That was in the early 2000s. Um, we currently have about 15 and about five that are actively going in due to COVID. Um, and so it, it is a challenge. Volunteerism across the country is down. And again, for our volunteers, it's a little bit different. It isn't like going and volunteering at a school or a library. You have to be certified. You have to do a certain number of hours a week. There's background checks. There's um, report out requirements. They have to attend monthly trainings. And so it's a very demanding uh, role. And a lot of the work that they're doing can be, it's, it's heavy work. It's not your average volunteer work. So we're doing a big push. You're gonna hear lots of commercials coming out um, looking for us to get volunteers. And I've changed some of the scope of the volunteering to allow for other opportunities. Um, we used to require like eight to 10 hours a week. And I'm kind of at the point where I'd like to see people even do four hours a week in a building. So making some of those adjustments to um, better represent the people that we might be able to bring on board at this time. 
Thank you, and good luck with that effort. It's so important, and um, I know so many uh, nonprofits rely on uh, volunteers, and I, I think COVID has really um, hurt that for for everybody. So, um, hopefully, uh, we continue to to get through this. Um, if I'm going to just double check that we don't have any more questions before I kind of um, uh, start wrapping this up a little bit and talking about um, the next schedule. Um, does anybody have anything else they want to add before kind of moving on? Okay, great. Well, I think this was a, a good, very good um, discussion on, on organization and what we need to be thinking about with the end goal of determining, you know, whether this is appropriate from our state. Um, I think we've, we've learned a lot about um, what direction the country is going and why th th this might be something um, that we, we're going to, to have to go to uh, in order to get our, um, our funding in place in certain areas. Um, and I'm really grateful to this group for putting their time into this so that we can do this correctly, um, you know, if, if we decide to go down this route. Um, so I think, you know, next meeting, my view is that we would we would come with um, some more data. Um, I think our administrators will help me pull together um, the list of that. And um, I will be following up with each of the people that um, uh, volunteered to, to facilitate that data collection and that hopefully that we'll be able to circulate that um, a couple days before um, the meeting, um, our next meeting. Um, and so that when we come to that meeting, we can kind of come prepared a little bit about that data and really explore the sort of pros and cons, if you will, of, um, of, this, uh, of this role and um, how uh, that would look. I would say future meetings, we, um, based on what we find in the in, in the next meeting you know taking it talking a little bit about more about the financial aspect and about where it would be housed and um, how we could um, think about that going forward now i have put together we put together a, a a hefty schedule in terms of i just wanted to get dates in, in your schedules um, that we would like to be able to meet be meeting um, again we may not need all of these dates, but I would um, like to put them out there just to reserve that, just in the fact if um, we do need more time to um, come up with some uh, thoughtful recommendations. So we have today's meeting. Uh, we have our next meeting, which will be on September 23rd. Um, the, the following meeting, October 28th. Um, and then we have moved up the November and December schedule instead of being the, the sort of fourth Thursday in the month with getting to the end of the year holidays. Uh, we just moved it up a, a week. Now, again, we may or may not need this extra time, but I just wanted to get it out there. Um, and again, I'd like to try to keep all of our meetings uh, less than two hours. My, my goal is to kind of keep them about an hour and a half um, on, the, on the longer side. Um, and we may not need all of that time, um, but just trying to respect everybody's time. And again, I, I know it's it's all so busy with uh, everything we all have going on. Um, does anybody have any questions about the um, forward schedule or any sort of the other topics and other things that you think that we need to be uh, addressing as part of um, the, the future working group sessions. This is not my area of expertise, so I am looking to you to, to help me um, think to make sure we got everything and we don't have to, to sort it all out today, but if there is something you wanna come to a, another working group and things that we need to address to make this work better, I uh, appreciate uh, the feedback because it is, as I said, I, I'm an accountant bean counter by trade and came out of investment banking. So that's not my, uh, you know, this is not my area of expertise. It's just something I'm passionate about and just want to make sure that we're, we're doing the right thing for the people of our state. Diane, I'm going to let you have a, a quick word here. Yes, uh, this has been very helpful and very um, 
a great a great session good discussion um as we're looking at systems um i don't know about some a lot of you are in the business um, i would love us to look at each system once we're getting data uh, varying if it includes complaints or issues or cases but i i would like to know for each of the uh, state agencies involved in handling a complaint how does just very briefly for each one of those agencies how does that go um, and what is the outcome uh, you know i'm sure there are a variety of outcomes but um that that's something that I think would be very helpful in deciding the, the future steps is, is there a good system of, is there a good complaint system in each of these agencies where there are that, um, that um, um, process or not? And how could we tweak that so that everyone feels they're heard and treated fairly? Great point, Diane. Um... I will add that to our list um, and we can explore that a little bit more next time. Um, is there any other questions before I adjourn today's meeting? Excellent. Well, I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of your day and you don't melt in this heat and humidity that we're having. And um, thank you to everyone for your time today. It really is valuable. And um, I'm really honored to work with such a great group of knowledgeable people. Um, and um, happy to, uh, if you have something to follow up on, uh, please email um, my, uh, our administrator, Heather Ferguson Hall, who will be, I'm emailing you all the the agendas and every all the information in advance of next uh, next meeting. Um, but if you have uh, something that comes up, you can send her and I an email, and we're um, happy to to help follow up on that. So um, with that, I am going to adjourn today's meeting and thank everybody for their time. Enjoy your rest of your week and enjoy the end of summer, which what we have left of it. Have a good one. Thank you very much. Thank you.